I'm also will try to see some of the newer molecules as well, which is commonly used for anticoagulation, which is already called as NOAX. So what has been happening is, especially in the coming few years, and even in the last few years, our options to anticoagulate a patient was very much limited. So what we were using normal, most commonly was warfarin, otherwise some of the other newer anticoagulants. But what has been happening as well, with the passage of time, even more anticoagulants has been getting added, like the apixaban, rivaroxaban, and of course the age-old dabigatrin as well. So a lot of times there is confusion, what we would like to do, in what kind of conditions, how can we use them, and also, of course, there will be some problems. What about the data which is coming out due to the complications? So we are always curious as well, so even for that. So as we all know, dabigatrin is available in two strengths, 110 and 150 milligrams uh, and of course it has to be used BD. So when they try to compare using the standard data of all those clinical trials, for example Rely trial was the one which was used for dabigatrin, Aristotle was used for the apixaban. Similarly Rocket AF was one of the most major trial due to which rivaroxaban approval also came up. Similarly the late entrant has been idoxaban on the basis of engaged AF TV study. So when they tried to see for the major bleeding, in fact for the 110 and 150 milligrams, the bleeding risk was almost similar. Okay. However, if you try to compare for the Aristotle, which was there for the Apixaban, it is definitely pretty higher, right? Similarly, when it came for the comparing for the intracranial hemorrhage, so that is another significant side effect which tends to happen for the usage of anticoagulants. So again we can notice there is a significant difference for the dabigatrin versus the apixaban. Similarly even compared to the other newer entrants as well. So after such uh, uh, the most common side effects there are some uh, less common side effects as well something like the ischemic stroke otherwise like the hemorrhagic stroke or even the cardiovascular mortality because we are not just inter interested in just giving a medicine to the patient. We are also think thinking about decreasing the mortality and also the morbidity rates as well. So when we compare over there, in fact, for example, if you try to give just dabigatrin, for example, the risk reduction is almost 35%, which is definitely significantly, uh, and when you compare it to the traditional one, which is like warfarin, otherwise even for this molecule, apixaban, we can see it over here, it is just like 21%. So they, again, there is a significant difference, so which tends to favor the time-tested molecule which is dabigatrin. Even for the ischemic stroke or the hemorrhagic stroke as well, when we try to compare it with the other newer molecules as well, it tends to definitely favor dabigatrin. So one of the common questions what comes to our mind is, what about the different dosages of dabigatrin? How do, are they faring up compared to the different dosages of course of the other molecule as well? So when we compare even over here, so we see it over here is, in fact, there is robust data for both the dosages as well and in fact, the, uh, the side effects are also pretty much similar and in fact, they are much safer as well. So what can we do? So they also try to uh, do what is called as a forest plot. So forest plot, what happens is, so in the basis of the dots, you will try to see if they go on a one side, so for example, this side, so this will be favoring the dabigatrin and this side will be favoring the warfarin. So if you will see over here, of course, there is a big advantage, significantly. So for example, for all the uh, these parameters, they tend to favor the dabigatrin. So in fact, when they try to use slightly lower dosage, slightly lower dosage is 110, I'm not talking about 75. 75 milligrams should always be reserved only for the renally compromised patients, okay? So for even for the 110 milligram BD dosage, there's significant reduction in fact, not just in the hospitalization, but also in the mortality. So most of the data, of course, the gold standard, what is come, uh, what is there is, comes from the, what is called as a randomized control trials. However, in the real uh, life or in the real uh, uh, scenario, there's no head to head control uh, studies in fact. So for example, one molecule versus the other. So what they have been trying to do is, especially in the real world, they try to see what what happens in the clinical scenario, okay? 
then for example they also try to put up those uh, studies which is called a systemic reviews and meta analysis in which they try to combine and try to see for the different parameters so in fact in one of the studies they try to see a long term follow up study long term follow up means 6.7 years 7 years is a really long time for these kind of patients and that when they saw it so they could see it. of course there is a again significant difference right so for example 150 mg when you are trying to use for the major bleeding yes there was slightly higher uh, bleeding risk even for uh, the higher dosage of the gabigatrin similarly for the ich or however for the stroke surprisingly for the lower dosage it was slightly higher right similarly for the ischemic stroke or even for the mortality as well when they try to see but let me try to tell you one thing whenever you are trying to do a dose selection just not uh, close your eyes and do it like this so you should also try to see for the other parameters which will be helpful in choosing your dosage for example how about those renal parameters and how about those other comorbid conditions for example the liver function tests as well so then what had happened is they just they try to see for the safety of this molecule it has not been just tested in one or two countries it has been in fact for most of the countries in fact almost around the world and let's not forget it, this is the molecule which has been there since the longest time with us so huge clinical data set is available so uh, what has happened is of course it has been tested globally wide across usa denmark france taiwan as well and there are a lot of other centers as well which are also trying to test it not just the academic centers the private hospitals even the companies and all and they are trying to see several long term prospective data as well so what has been happening is when they try to compare for the time tested the one of the oldest molecule which is the vitamin k antagonist like give me some examples warfarin uh, acetron so when they try to compare davigatrin versus these molecules they saw it like this in fact 71% almost two third two third of this group was there was significantly lesser major bleeding risk so is it safer would you like any of your dear near and dear ones to have a bleeding problem of course not so similarly uh, only 29% of the uh, analysis so which is like almost third so it's not so good number which was tend to uh, say like okay it has a similar vitamin k antagonist uh, compared to the other ones so similarly they try to uh, in one of the studies they try to compare the data of like almost half million half million patient half million patients is like 550000 550, 000 patients so almost half million patients so these were all the studies which were included and when they try to put up the forest plot graph again we can see of course majority of the studies majority of the studies are favoring the dabigatrin isn't it so there is hardly any studies which is tending to favor the vitamin k antagonist although as i already said it there is no head to head comparison so most of these studies they have been independent studies but they try to put them together and they try to compare the data so as i already said it for example uh in uh, there were nine meta analysis so for example when they try to compare dabigatrin versus rivaroxaban so in fact almost 80% 80% of the analysis showed major bleeding is significantly reduced when someone is using a dabigatrin however only one fifth of the studies they said it like this is rivaroxaban is almost having a similar risk so majority of the studies are again favoring dabigatrin similarly so when they try to see for the risk of major bleeding compared to the dabigatrin versus rivaroxaban as well so what do we see over here the dots are all shifted in the other side which is favoring the dabigatrin but of course as i already said it there is no head to head comparison so we need to have further more real time data uh, global data as well maybe in the future more data may come up so in fact after coming to the two uh, factors even on for example for the major bleeding so when they tried to compare for the dabigatrin versus apixaban so we already showed for warfarin for the rivaroxaban and then came the apixaban apixaban is a new entrant so for that as well almost 82% 82% 
majority of them. So, and less than one fifth of the study, they said, oh, uh, you know, there's highest uh, significantly increased bleeding with the apixaban, in fact. And this is the forest plot which was uh, taken care of. Over here, yes, it is favoring the apixaban, but uh, over here, when we try to look at the data over here, almost 82% of them, they said it like this, that it is almost comparable. So this is one of the always biggest confusion that, for example, for the major bleeding, which one tends to be better? So, but when we try to look at the real-time data, so almost they say it like this, that no, they are comparable. So, so what happens now when we try to look an, on an overall basis? So what ha tends to happen? So on an overall basis, there is consistency and also favor for a single molecule, which is dabigatrin, in fact. So that's why. So over here, that's what they all have been trying to see. However, uh, one of the other parameters in which it was similar to the apixaban. So uh, USFD is a very strong body. Okay, they try to compare a lot of other parameters. They try to see how is the data and all. So in fact, one of the unique um, independent uh, board of FDA, they try to do a sub meta analysis from the rely trial. Okay, they try to see. Okay. Let's try to see the different parameters and how are these patients doing over here. So once they try to do the comparison for nearly like 18,000 patients uh, from the RELY trial and for the Medicare patients like 1,34,000, again a huge data set. So they could see what was happening is over here is warfarin, as you can see when compared to the 150 milligram BD dosage, which is having a higher ischemic stroke, warfarin. If you're in ICH as well, it tends to uh, go in favor of warfarin. So warfarin is associated with more risk of intracranial hemorrhage, major bleeding as well. Similarly, when they try to see, for example, about the 100 persons per year risk as well. So majority of these parameters, they tend to go in favor of the dabigatron. And worst thing is when you try to look for the mortality, because we are interested in saving those patients. We don't want to kill those patients. We want to help them. We want to give them a better quality of life. Unfortunately, the risk is much higher with the warfarin. And not just in one, both the studies in fact. Okay, And the p-values are very significant. Okay, So similarly, uh, as I was telling about the FDA analysis, they also try to see, for example, what about those major extracranial bleeding or major GI bleeding as well. So over here, what do we see over here? For example, for the rivaroxaban or the dabigatrin. In fact, surprisingly, for the rivaroxaban as well, for these two parameters, it is higher. So I remember in 2013 or 14, when I was studying for my board certification exams, really one of the side effects which was already said to us about dabigatrin was gastric intolerability or gastric irritation, in fact. So this is another nice data which shows that there is major GI bleeding, in fact, with rivaroxaban, in fact. So this is what is called as, anyone can say, what is called as Kaplan-Meier curve. So in Kaplan-Meier curve, you are having two parameters. So for example, on the time, on the passage of time, how are they following up? So for example, on the parameters of death, or even for the major GI bleeding. So what is happening is, the rivaroxaban is already having an edge. But is it good to have an edge on these two kind of parameters? Of course not. So they are having a higher risk associated with the major GI bleeding and also with death as well. So then let's try to look at those other parameters as well. What is called as something like the intracranial hemorrhage. So if you're in intracranial hemorrhage as well, from early, like almost like just one month after the uh, uh, initiation of the follow-up, you can start noticing they start diverging and they start diverging in a very very significant way even for thromboembolic uh, stroke as well some of the people have been telling no no there is higher association for example with the dabigatrin however we are not just looking at the mortality of the patient you know for example for four months five months six months so you are trying to look for long-term follow-up long-term follow-up spanning over like one year and all so after eight months itself they start converging and in fact after like almost 10 months itself, they are almost similar. So almost similar. As I said it, you are not just trying to look on a single parameter. You are trying to look on an overall basis 
for lot many other parameters as well. So even in the FD analysis, when they try to look over here, for example, in the different age groups, or otherwise one of the worst things, uh, those uh, cardiac patients tend to have what is called as the chronic kidney disease. And otherwise, in fact, for those most of the patients as well, uh, we also tend to uh, see for the chance to score, in fact. For example, to start anticoagulation or not, huh? isn't it? So that's what when they try to see as well, this data again favored dabigatrin versus rivaroxamab. So as I was already telling, one of the most common uh, comorbid conditions which happens with the coronary artery disease or heart problems is renal outcomes. So they try to really see, for example, how are those patients doing it? Uh, for example, dabigatrin versus the other molecule, in fact. So again, we see it over here. This tends to do much better, isn't it? Over here, in spite of, for example, if someone is having a double higher rate of doubling of the creatinine, otherwise even 30% decline in EGFR, it's a very significant value because whenever we are thinking of a dosage as well. So what happens is they try to look again, for example, for the different dosage of the uh, different uh, NOACs like the apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, or versus the 110 and 150 milligram of the dabigatrin as well. And when they try to see it over here, again, of course, all the NOACs that did much better compared to the warfarin. However, even on an individual basis, if we try to see 110 milligram of dabigatrin as, was the one which did have a much significant advantage. So this is a wonderful slide, I would say. Really, we all should have it in literally in our mind, I would say. And you know why? Because a lot of times what happens is, okay, someone is already having a problem. So then uh, what kind of drug shall we be choosing for that patient? So for example, if there is already a someone who is already having a recurrent stroke. So for example, once the patient had already a stroke, Again, the patient had TIA. Again, no, there was some other problem. So the, there is evidence which shows that try, better try to use the higher dosage of dabigatrin. So same way, for example, if someone is having really severe renal failure, so what you should be doing is, yes, you can choose. There are other options as well which should be available. In fact, this is the condition, only condition where the lowest possible dose of dabigatrin, which is 75 milligrams, should be used. Similarly, for the higher risk of GI bleeding as well, these two other molecules which should be used, for example, apixaban or lower dosage of dabigatrin. Similarly, if someone is having a dyspepsia, so some of those best molecules will be is, try to use any of these molecules. So this is a wonderful slide, so we should, I would really suggest anyone try to have this chart in front of them and uh, whenever in confusion, just try to refer to that. So similarly, a lot of times, no, the patient will be telling, okay, I don't like to eat this medicine like twice daily or huh, but this is too much for me. I want to have it only once. So again, for the once do daily dosage, yes, vitamin K antagonists are there. However, we know what are the problems which is associated with that. Even edoxaban is pretty good or rivaroxaban, but we also need to look for the other problems as well. So... So even in this, edoxaban is, should not be actually be preferred. So what should be preferred is rivaroxaban and vitamin K antagonists. So to summarize, there are a lot of NOACs which is available. Now, edoxaban, apixaban, rivaroxaban, dabigatrin as well is there. However, when we try to look at the different randomized controlled trials and all, or real world studies, what is happening is dabigatrin tends to have a much superior efficacy compared to the uh, other molecules, especially in a subset of uh, atrial fibrillation, okay? In fact, and one of the other things what we are always worried about is the reversal agent. So, for example, what happens is if there is a molecule, if we are giving, can we reverse them? I, I can never forget, uh, for example, uh, being in, uh, at Paris itself, it was like almost maybe like four months back, so one of the patient was already on one of the fancy new molecules. So what had happened, that patient developed the bleed. And I was asked, really, I, I, I will not name the person. One of the senior worst person in the department, boss, you have been taking care of all this, you have published so much and all. Please tell us how to take care. I said, look, for this molecule, there is no antidote, at least in India. 
so now what so after that what what i noticed no at least that senior person started coming down on usage of that another mall so let's not forget there is a specific reversal agent as well which is really easy to use not so difficult and we can use it in fact and there is a short saying what is called as time is brain and why is it because as i said it whenever you are trying to give be ready for the complications as well problems can happen a stitch in nine a stitch in time saves nine let's not forget that